Supreme Court rules against life. We'll talk about it today on the broadcast. And yet another Supreme Court decision, five to four, the Supreme Court has struck down a law that was similar to the Texas law that was there in 2016, though there was a, a major flip in one of the justices, and that was uh, the chief justice, who in when the, a similar law that was actually broader was up before the court in 2016, though it was clear he would be in the dissent, he had no problem siding with Texas as a dissenter. It was a five to three case. In, in this case... Again, you see something very different from Chief Justice Roberts. I, I mean, it's a reminder. This is not so shocking with him because of what happened with the Affordable Care Act. And remember how he did the same, similar thing, actually, in the, to this opinion. Just as an unfortunate reminder to people yeah. who are listening to the broadcast, Dad, is he did that same thing where the, the case itself, he didn't really agree with the reasoning. Right. But he agrees with the outcome, so he made up his own way to get there. Usually our judges and theirs is that they, they have in their mind where they, they're going to be. They just come up with a reasoning to be there. So I, And our guys actually follow their reasoning. I think here's the issue, and I think this is the issue that we have to be very cognizant of. John Roberts three years ago said the law was constitutional, a law that was much broader than this particular law. This was a more narrowly tailored law. Four justices dissented last time. The, of course, then you had the switch of justices. What happens here? John Roberts says, I don't agree necessarily with the reasoning of the majority, yep. but because of stare decisis, I am going to stick with that opinion. Now, if that was the case, Plessy versus Ferguson, which was separate but equal, would still be the law of the land. There are times when stare decisis, the courts realize things were wrong. Karamatsu where the internment of Japanese Americans in World War II. That case today would obviously not be followed. So this uh, this application of stare decisis, Andy, the Latin, of course, uh, important here, but John Roberts had an easy way to say, look, I thought it was wrong then, I think it was wrong now, but he didn't go that way. No, and that is very disappointing. Stare decisis simply means that cases that have been decided one way, the Supreme Court or any court should continue to follow that precedent because it's binding on a subsequent court. But as you pointed out, sometimes old decisions like Plessy versus Ferguson and Korematsu are wrong, and you have to say that they're wrong. And you can't rely on stare decisis, which is judicial precedent, to say that they are right. And John Roberts disappoints yet again by having the opportunity to follow what he did in the Texas case and the Louisiana case. He didn't do that. He joined with the majority and again, disappoints, uh, uh, once again, the uh, those of us who are pro-life and who believe in the sanctity of human life. I will point out, you know, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, were part of that strong uh, dissent. There is this question, though, what, you know, is it different now? Start Have you ever seen a Democratic so, appointee to the Supreme Court become no, a we conservative? we talked about that on Friday. Byron White, only example, but and that's been, been a long time. A, a lot of pressure on John Roberts, and he saw what happened in 2012 when you, when you go – against your principles, against your views, even when you've been on the record with those views and you, you uphold their laws, even if the reasoning doesn't make any sense. Folks, the ACLJ is doing work all across the country on all the issues that you care about, all across the world on the issues you care about. And we're able to broadcast it to you because of your support. We're able to do the work in our country because of your support. We're able to do the work internationally because of your financial support. And this is a great time to make a financial contribution to the ACLJ because it's a matching challenge month. What does that mean? We have a group of donors ready to match every donation that comes into the ACLJ right now at aclj.org. You're literally doubling the impact of your donation. Your $25 donation, that's where you're charging your credit card. But that's like $50 for us to ACLJ. No amount too small, no amount too big. It all makes a huge impact. Go to aclj.org. Be part of our matching challenge and donate today. I was at a board meeting at Jews for Jesus and the executive director said we've got a case. The Supreme Court had just granted review. It was about literature distribution at airports. We wanted to have the Bible study meet in the school, but it turned into a problem when the principal said, no, you can't have it. I told her that I wanted to sing Noel 
and the principal said that we can't have anything to do with Christ in our songs. We marched around the country defending evangelism in Chicago, in Boston, in New York, Atlanta, Texas, Southern California, Northern California, and points in between. The IRS is expected to reveal the results of an internal investigation that shows the agency targeted conservative groups. This was a complete misuse of the Office of the Internal Revenue Service. We only persevered because the ACLJ was there. The federal courts do not need to become monitors of state trespass actions, and that's all this is. We were looking for the right to speak our minds and our consciences, and we won that right today. Those of us that believe in life know that we're on the right side of history. We understand full well, children are children, and they're precious in God's sight, and they're precious in our nation's sight, and they're precious to parents. Religious persecution is a situation where your life is literally put in jeopardy simply because of what you believe. Can you help? Can you do something? He's on death row, and so we launched an international campaign. If we don't use that freedom to advocate for these people suffering under religious persecution, who will? John Roberts falls on the issue of stare decisis. He said the decision was in 2016. I thought it was, I thought the court is wrong here on the substance, but I'm bound by stare decisis. What does stare decisis mean, Andy? Stare decisis means that cases on similar facts should be decided the same way. And once the court has spoken on something and has decided something a certain way, then it should be bound and cannot change its opinion and its decision making process anymore. That's the way they decided. And when you had separate but equal in Plessy versus Ferguson, when you had the Japanese internment camps and the Korematsu decision, as you pointed out, stare decisis would mean that we can't deviate from that today. Well, of course we can. And we should be able to deviate from decisions that are wrongly decided. This was a cop-out by the Chief Justice and very disappointing, Jay. Jordan. Your sense of what's going on here. I mean, is this, do you think these are political decisions? Do you think these are legal yeah, I decisions? Think I think it's political decisions by John Roberts. He likes the praise. I think he likes, he thinks that uh, in some way, you know, this is good for his legacy when he does this thing like the Affordable Care Act. And then after the Affordable Care Act, he, remember, he was, since then, he was in the dissent on a law that was much broader than Louisiana's. I mean, legally speaking, it didn't, doesn't read that much, but it was different. The impact was different. He was in the dissent, but when he had to be the, the the vote, and listen, he put himself in this position. I don't know why he's made himself out to be another Kennedy. You don't have to, you don't have don't to have that on the either. court. You don't have to have the tiebreaker vote. But I do think that he likes the praise. I think he likes the media coverage of this today, in the sense that the liberal media, which is the the mainstream media, is praising him, and I think he loves it. I think he loved it with the Affordable Care Act, it, even though he knew the people that got him to the Supreme Court. Couldn't figure out even, well, the reasoning, he just comes out and says it. I don't agree with their philosophy. Remember, we talked on Friday yep. about typically the difference between these two sets of judges, why everyone knew where this case went if Justice Breyer is the author, is because it doesn't matter. He will come up with whatever. He'll go to international law, and he'll tell you. He will find law that agrees with his position somewhere that's sometime been written. And our guys are not supposed to be doing that, right? The guys on the right... The people who are coming with a judicial philosophy that's supposed to be a more conservative judicial philosophy, look at the Constitution, look at the look at the history as well, but look at the Constitution itself. Does a state have this? Or is this a federal government's role to step in here? And this case was actually, the difference between this and Texas also, was this case was supposed to be about who had the standing. Yeah. It wasn't even supposed to be about undue burdens. No, and the standing issue, I think, would have been the, 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 the easy way out. I want to bring in C.C. Howells, the senior counsel with the ACLJ, because what this also does not bode well for, and nobody wants to say this, but I'm going to, it does not bode well for an overturn of Roe versus Wade. C.C.? Yeah, you know, we see that um, this the, the court just keeps changing um, abortion laws and rules. And under Casey, of course, they required that there would be an undue burden imposed by the law. And then we saw in Whole Woman's Health, which was the previous case to this June case, that 
they couldn't prove that there was an undue burden. So the court changes and says, well, if there's no benefit or if it's unnecessary, that's going to equal the undue burden. And so, you know, it's that faulty assumption um, that abortion is safe and therefore admitting privileges are unnecessary. That's what this whole decision was based on. And we submitted a brief in this um, case that attacked that erroneous underlying assumption. But it just goes to show that the co- this court or the Supreme Court is willing to keep changing um, laws and even constitutional laws to protect the judicially fabricated right to abortion. And that doesn't uh, bode well for an overturn of Roe v. Wade. You know, there's another interesting aspect of this, and we did, I'm holding in my hand, if you're watching on TV, the brief that we filed in the case, and this was about admitting privileges to hospitals, although I, I agree with Jordan, it could have been decided on standing, but what's interesting here in our brief, we actually attach as an exhibit, and it's probably 65 pages, every time hospitals, uh, ambulances were called to abortion clinics for medical services to be rendered in a hospital that these doctors don't have to have admitting privileges for. I mean, think about that for a moment. And that was in the brief, and that was in the record, and it was it basically they ignored. They ignored it to get to a desired result here, Andy. This was, in a sense, uh, the shock to me is that Chief Justice Roberts, who I've known for many years, um, decided that a case that had three years of precedent that was closely divided could not be overturned. Well, of course it could be overturned. Look, he ruled that the Texas law was constitutional. He was in the dissent. It was only three years ago. What has changed? What has changed? He comes up with this fabricated idea that, oh, I'm bound by precedent. Even though I didn't agree with that precedent, I'm bound by that precedent, and I've got to rule that way. No, you don't. You've got to rule by what the law is. And what the law in Louisiana was was a constitutional exercise of that sovereign state's privilege to protect its citizens by saying that a doctor had to have admitting privileges in a hospital within 30 miles of where the abortion clinic, or may I say the death chamber, take place, uh, exists. And that was a cur- perfectly proper exercise of the sovereign state's right to protect the safety and welfare of its citizens. Justice Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, did not have to do what he did in this case, and I am very, very disappointed in him. Let me go to Than Bin in Washington, D.C. Than, obviously, listen, we're an organization. We work on these nomination battles. Uh, John Roberts was a, it was a different time, obviously, now, but we do I, – I think that there is a question, Than, about – and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have – we talked about it on Friday. It's not that – I'm not expecting – to agree with Brett Kavanaugh or Neil Gorsuch or Justice Thomas or everybody, anybody, Every time. 99% of the time, like they are on the other side. I'm just not expecting that. Because I think if you actually take a philosophy and apply it, there are you can sometimes come out different ways, sure. and, and, and but at least we know it's grounding you. John Roberts threw that out the window today, so I think there's a new question now for the more conservative members of the U.S. Senate next time this happens, which is, uh, you know, we already we went through a... I guess a suitor, and now we have a Roberts. Jordan, if you find a judge that you agree with every time, that's not a judge, that's an advocate. But what you can request from a judge or actually demand from a judge is that they take uh, the philosophy of judging, they look at the statute, they look at the Constitution, they look at the law, and they apply it as it was written. You ha- you have to expect from a judge that you don't have outcome-based judging. We've seen it on the left time and time again. And, Jordan, it's why you said last week that we have got to do uh, – we basically have to have a supermajority on the courts because you're not going to get a judge every single time while the left does. Uh, Let me tell you what this looks like to me, though, Jordan. This looks to me like an abandonment of apolitical judging. This looks like looking at the political tea leaves, the pressure in Washington, D.C., the social circles. I know that's insulting to say, but it's just reality. It exists here, Jordan. And this, to me, especially with such a recent opinion from the chief justice that said the exact opposite thing and a narrower law here, Jordan, it looks like to me that you have a judge that wants to be liked in those circles. I know that's an insult. I don't like to say it, but that's what it looks like to me. If the court politicizes its decisions like that, that can be yeah. very, very damaging. Yeah, when you have a court that starts saying, and the chief justice of the court, so he thinks he thinks it's better for his legacy to say things like, I don't agree with how they got here, but I just like the conclusion. I mean, anybody else could anybody could do that. Why go through those processes? And and again, I think it just it shows you some of this you look at 
part of this is lifetime appointments. Part of this is also they've taken lifetime appointments to mean they don't ever leave. So we've kind of made this. Uh, it's a different. It's a different entity than it was in our, by our founders. Folks, the ACLJ is doing work all across the country on all the issues that you care about, all across the world on the issues you care about, and we're able to broadcast it to you because of your support. We're able to do the work in our country because of your support. We're able to do the work internationally because of your financial support. And this is a great time to make a financial contribution to the ACLJ because it's a matching challenge month. What does that mean? We have a group of donors ready to match every donation that comes into the ACLJ right now at aclj.org. You're literally doubling the impact of your donation. Your $25 donation, that's where you're charging your credit card, but that's like $50 for us to ACLJ. No amount too small, no amount too big. It all makes a huge impact. Go to aclj.org, be part of our matching challenge and donate today. For 30 years, the American Center for Law and Justice has been dedicated to protecting your religious and constitutional freedoms. Because of you, we've seen great success in the courts and Congress concerning the issues that matter most to you and your families. ACLJ Chief Counsel Jay Sekulow. Our decades-long commitment to the Constitution and the rule of law is at the center of everything we do. The bottom line, our work could not take place without your generous support. It's a critical time for our nation and our world. With so many challenges facing our country, the work of the American Center for Law and Justice has never been more important. There's no better way to support the ACLJ than through online giving. We truly appreciate your financial support. Without it, it would be impossible to do our work here and around the globe. And the best way to support our work is to make your financial gifts online at aclj.org. Donating online is safe and secure, and an online gift at aclj.org can be put to work immediately, enabling the ACLJ to continue the battle against abortion giant Planned Parenthood. These are our young people in their 20s and 30s that are doing this, are fighting for life at a whole new level to beat back the abortion juggernaut. We've got a whole group of young lawyers that are defending them. To protect Christians facing persecution, release of Andrew Brunson. He is the American evangelical from North Carolina held in Turkey for more than two years. We're grateful to ACLJ who put it out to these people, you know, who were, they were getting all this out. I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and actually I'm astounded. To stand up for our good friend Israel, to work to uncover the corrupt deep state in Washington, and so much more. Take part in our matching challenge today. You can make a difference in the work we do. Give a gift today online at aclj.org. Justice Thomas said in response directly to the Chief Justice in his uh, dissent, uh, despite the fact that we granted Louisiana's petition specifically to address, I mean, whether abortion providers can be presumed to have third-party standing. I mean, that was, that was the initial reason why they even made a difference between this case and the Texas case, to challenge health and safety regulations on behalf of their patients. Chief Justice cast aside this jurisdictional barrier to conclude that Louisiana's law is unconstitutional under our precedence. So, I, I, again, I think it's been clear, again, everyone's not a John Roberts, everyone is not a, a, a Kennedy, everyone is not a suitor. I think it's been tougher I, first, conservatives didn't really get involved in this until much later than I think the left. So the left, On the abortion was, issue. The yeah. le well, it wasn't even a, it wasn't even that partisan. I mean, if you look at Roe versus Wade, mostly Republican uh, nominees to the court. Yeah, Planned Parenthood supported Planned Parenthood. This was kind of when social conservatives, uh, Catholics, got more involved in the pro life yeah. effort. Then, then it was Protestant churches started actually even talking about things like abortion. Which, if it was related to anything about sex, oh, a lot of the a lot usually of denominations didn't were pro-choice for yes. a long, long time into the '70s, and uh, I think it was until the '80s that the, for instance, the Southern Baptist changed. Let me, but I don't want people to lose hope here, no. uh, because we've also seen significant wins on the life issue out of the Supreme Court, CC, especially in our defense of crisis pregnancy centers. Yeah, we've seen legislation um, pushed to shut down pro-life centers, um, typically tried in more liberal states. We've had cases in New York and California as well as others where we successfully um, represented pro-life centers 
um, against laws that were basically forcing them to promote abortion or to refer for abortion. Um, and, you know, we won on that, that, that these laws cannot um, compel speech from pro-life centers that don't agree with what the pro-life center stands for. Yeah, so again, and those were significant wins, and those were at the Supreme Court, and we had a couple of those cases. Uh, we, I think we had two that were up there uh, on that that we won. So it's not like we're not seeing victories. But, Andy, the concern is here. I mean, I think people are looking at the last couple of decisions, and you shouldn't judge any justice by two decisions. But you look at the decisions that are coming out, and uh, there's reason for concern. There is reason for concern. I I agree with what Jordan was saying. There's a certain... Uh, glamour that the chief justice seems to be entranced with the media uh, spotlight that he gets whenever he rules with the left and whenever he goes with the liberals. It's very nice when you go to Washington cocktail parties to be courted by the liberal left and say how great a decision you did. And I think he has fallen prey to this, Jay, because, you know, he has done things like in the Obamacare uh, decision, like in this decision today, that just do not support the philosophy that he maintained throughout his judicial career. So what's this all about? Yeah, well, I mean, you thought, you know, you thought a decision was wrong three years ago, and now today you say, well, I've got to change my vote because even though I thought that was wrong, stare decisis says I'm compelled to do the opposite. Not true. But it is not true because, as I pointed out, there's been a lot of decisions that have been has been turned. You know, the Supreme Court has changed their mind and have reversed the previous decisions. It happens all the time. Let's go ahead and take a call. Let's go to Kristen in Maine, online one. Kristen, welcome to JSECU Live. You're on the air. Uh, hi, Jay and Jordan. Thank you for all that you do. Um, my question is, well, first of all, I'm really grieved by the decisions that um, Justice Roberts has been making. But I'm just wondering if there's anything we can do as citizens to contact him to let him know. I know we can as senators, but yeah, no, um, I mean, about- you, you, you can't because it's a lifetime appointment, as I believe it should be, even when you disagree with the justice's conclusion. So I, I don't want to take that away from the Constitution's clear on that. Uh, there's no way to express your grievance uh, as far as directly to the justice, and that would frankly be inappropriate. And look, there's some other decisions coming that. You know, we may be pleased about Justice Roberts' decisions. I don't know. I thought he did a very admirable job, for instance, a very good job in the uh, impeachment proceeding. He handled it with dignity and with decorum. He handled it with um, uh, sticking to the law. He was the John Roberts that, when he said during his confirmation proceeding, uh, I call him balls and strikes, an umpire. Uh, An umpire doesn't say, though, in my view, well, the last time we called it a ball, so this next one has to be a ball, too. And I think, Cece, that's kind of where he got it wrong here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even even as I read his words, um, they were just shocking. The fact that, you know, I didn't agree with the whole woman's health um, decision. It was wrongly decided, but it doesn't matter. Right or wrong, I have to adhere to it in deciding this present case. And that's just, you know, that's not true. It was a cop-out. It was a it, That was a bad statement and a bad decision. Well, it's also... What's the point of the Supreme Court then? Why why relitigate any issue? If we know that they're just going to go back to, why, why don't we have th- uh, three-fifths? Why do we have Dred Scott? Why do we have these cases even? Why do we go back and fight uh, for these issues? And also, why why give them that authority they have? Why not go back to pre-Marbury versus Madison when the court was basically a eh, court for, there'd be issues obviously where they would, they would make a big decision, but they didn't have any, no one really, cared what they decided. It wasn't something you stayed on for your whole life. Because if they're, if they're so impacted by the media and if they're so impacted by who's at their party and who's at their event, and more so than you'd think, by the way, a lot of them, it gets very tough to figure out, okay, who could you actually get through the U.S. Senate process now? Because that's now basically whoever's in control. It's gone down to 51. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, Thandy, there's no filibuster anymore. Yeah, right? no filibuster. Uh, you know, could you get a vacancy this summer? You can always get a vacancy, so you don't know. Um, how, how's it going to play out? I mean, it's it's all dependent on the election, unless there's a vacancy before. If there was a vacancy before, Than, do you think the Senate could get a nominee through? Yes, I do. 
I think they'd fill it. Leader McConnell has said the same thing. I mean, uh, Jay, you need a president willing to nominate and a Senate willing to confirm. Look, if the Senate didn't want to confirm, they wouldn't have to. Nominating. I don't think that would be the I, issue. I, My concern would be whether the Senate could get it done, and you're saying they can. But, well, in the last time around, uh, Jay, you didn't have the two components that the Constitution requires in order to get the confirmation. The Senate is, is perfectly welcome to sit on it if they want, but I suspect that this Senate would want to move if the president nominated uh, a new justice. And I will go back to something that Jordan said a minute ago. For much of the last decade, Jay, there was a double standard. When a Republican nominated a justice, it required 60 votes to overcome cloture. But when a Democrat president uh, appointed a justice, it only required 50 because Republicans were not willing to filibuster. We have only been on a level, level ground as far as confirming justices to the Supreme Court for a very short period of time now. So, yes, this is a very uh, disappointing ruling. Uh, but Jay and Jordan, uh, look, if you get a little bit more time where the, the the level field is playing. Maybe some of that dynamic in Washington where there's justices that sit on the court that want to be comfortable for the rest of their life term, uh, maybe that starts to change. Well, you have to wonder, too, is it better to have someone battle-tested like Brett Kavanaugh and, and Justice Thomas? Not saying anybody would ever want to go through what they've gone through, with Justice Thomas went through and what Brett Kavanaugh went through, but battle-tested, battle-tested nominees. You think about remember, the Gorsuch, even the Gorsuch vote. I mean, if you actually look at the vote, it barely gets on the court. So I think it changes how they think about things. And uh, and with John Roberts, too, I think he's kind of forgotten the process he went through. Folks, the ACLJ is doing work all across the country on all the issues that you care about, all across the world on the issues you care about. And we're able to broadcast it to you because of your support. We're able to do the work in our country because of your support. We're able to do the work internationally because of your financial support. And this is a great time to make a financial contribution to the ACLJ because it's a matching challenge month. What does that mean? We have a group of donors ready to match every donation that comes into the ACLJ right now at aclj.org. You're literally doubling the impact of your donation. Your $25 donation, that's where you're charging your credit card, but that's like $50 for us to ACLJ. No amount too small, no amount too big. It all makes a huge impact. Go to aclj.org, be part of our matching challenge and donate today. It is a critical time for our nation. And the American Center for Law and Justice is on the front lines, defending life and liberty, engaging the issues that matter most to you and your family. Whether it's working to protect Americans from the dangers of radical Islam and the persecution of Christians, to defending life at the U.S. Supreme Court, to protecting your religious and constitutional freedoms, we could not do this work without you, without your support. And now your support can really make a tremendous difference. For a limited time, you can participate in the ACLJ Matching Challenge. If you make a gift now, it will be doubled. $25 becomes $50. A $100 gift becomes $200. Please stand with the ACLJ right now and call 1-877-989-2255. That's 1-877-989-2255. Or go online at aclj.org. Thank you for your support. 